You are listening to Nehemia Gordon's Raw Stream of Torah Consciousness. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiahsWall.com. Before I get started, I, I want to really thank you guys for having me. Um, and particularly, I want to thank Dr. Burkle, who's the head of this university. I want to thank the uh, Israeli Alliance at McNeese. Can we get a round of applause for them? <laughs> I don't want to miss anybody. Dr. Mai, who's the uh, 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 advisor to the Israeli Alliance at McNeese. Uh, Kyle, Clifton, Joe. And last but not least, Adam, who, um, Adam Harris, who contacted me and said, would you come and speak here? And he assumed I was in Israel at the time. Happened to be I was spending some time in Dallas, Texas. And I said, yeah, that's less than an hour flight, sure. Um, my name is Nehemia Gordon. Uh, you can call me Nehemia. You can call me Nehemia, Nehemiah. Just don't call me Baldy. <laughs> it's very sensitive. Although this is a choice. Um, I tell myself that every day. <laughs> uh, and it becomes less and less of a choice every day. Uh, so in any event, um, I uh, grew up in Chicago. Uh, my father was an Orthodox rabbi in Chicago and a lawyer, and uh, moved to Israel in 1993, lived in Jerusalem for over 20 years, where I studied at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I did a double major for my undergrad, biblical studies and archaeology. Found out archaeology is digging through ancient garbage and decided to continue in biblical studies and uh, got my master's in biblical studies, worked in the Dead Sea Scrolls, worked with various Hebrew manuscripts. And that's really what I normally do, deal with Hebrew manuscripts. I've dealt with issues of the New Testament as it relates to the Hebrew and Jewish cultural background. Um, I'm what's known as a Karaite Jew. Do you guys know what that is? Um, it's a type of Jew, doesn't matter. We have a lot of denominations in Judaism. I think the Christians will have us beat with like 40,000. Um, so they invited me here to talk about the Holocaust. And what Adam told me when he invited me to come speak is that the theme of this event was, there are two themes, themes really, critical thinking and diversity. And I said, this is perfect. I have a topic that I've been working on for a number of years that fits the bill perfectly with that. And, I, and I'll share with them. That's, that, topic, that topic, I'll share, I'll tell you right now. That topic is, the, the, I call it the Lost Scrolls of Auschwitz. And we'll get to what that is. Before I, I get to that, I want to get a little bit of background about myself, of what I do, what I've been doing lately. I have a podcast called Hebrew Voices. It's one of the most exciting things I've ever done. What inspired me to do Hebrew Voices was really this whole idea of diversity. I'd been invited to speak at various churches in particular, and I would get people walking up to me afterwards and say, we're so glad you came to speak, but, but it was a big, there was a big uh, controversy about whether we could have you speak at our congregation because you're not a Christian. You're not a Messianic Jew. How can we as Christians have, or, or Torah keepers have you come speak at our congregation? I, I've heard all kinds of versions of this. I hear it all the time. And it got me thinking over the years, if they're so afraid to hear what I had to say, what are all those other Hebrew voices out there they were afraid to hear? And so the, the idea came to me. And I just want to give you an idea of some of the things I've done. Professor Emmanuel Tove, who's the editor-in-chief of the Dead Sea Scrolls, I actually worked for him during my master's uh, studies. And I interviewed him on the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was really interesting because he asked, he says, an interview this, with, with a, uh, like for regular people? He's used to writing, you know, a, a paper that's read by 12 people. And if it's 13, it's a bestseller. Uh, and he's excited about that. Uh, and half those 13 don't understand what he's talking about because he's so smart. And, and I said, no, th this is for just regular people who love the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's usually between 30 and 45 minutes. He said to me, I can't imagine what people would be interested in for 45 minutes about the Dead Sea Scrolls, meaning the common people. Because, you know, he deals with the complex linguistic things. And, of course, it's so, it's so exciting he doesn't understand to, to normal people. Uh, uh, the one, next one I did there is uh, uh, Deputy Minister Michael Oren, who is an ambassador to the United States. He's the world's uh, leading um, historian on the modern Israel, who's still alive. Uh, interviewed a lady who is an archaeologist who is putting back the floor of the second temple. They found pieces of the second temple, and they found all these different designs, and she went to the head archaeologist. She said, we've got hundreds of these pieces. 
shouldn't we try to put the floor back together? He said, I don't know how to do that. She said, well, my uh, undergrad was in mathematics. And she worked out the mathematics of how to do this. It's incredible stuff. Next lady down there in the f bottom left is a woman named uh, Shamir, who was uh, raised in the United States as a Muslim. Now lives in Israel and studies at uh, bar Ilan University in Israel, an Orthodox Jewish university. And she is um, not Orthodox. I guess uh, I like putting people in boxes. So I'm going to call her a Torah-keeping believer in Yeshua. Um, like, what an incredible journey, being raised as a Muslim. And, like, I'm mean, hearing all these incredible stories once I'm willing to listen and hear what's going on in the world beyond my little box. Uh, there's, I mean, that, it's just incredible. Um, I interviewed uh, Rabbi Dr. Abraham Torsky, who is a legend in the Jewish world. Uh, and I interviewed the head of the Jordanian opposition, who's living in exile in London with a, a life sentence hanging over his head if he ever returns to Jordan. So, so that's what Hebrew Voices is about. Understanding anything to do with uh, modern Israel, ancient Israel, ancient Judaism, Christianity, um, the Hebrew language, and just really exploring these issues. And see, you know, some of the episodes, people listen and say, hi, I didn't really like that. No problem, listen to the next one. Um, other people, it's interesting, some of the episodes that, I, I often hear from about the same episodes where people tell me that was the worst episode ever, and the other people tell me that was the best episode ever. <laughs> so to each their own, right? Um, before I actually get started talking about my main topic, which is the Holocaust and the scrolls of Auschwitz, I'm here at a university, and I felt I really couldn't speak at a university unless I said something about free speech. Free speech is under assault in the United States, and, and this breaks my heart. My father was a rabbi and a, um, and a lawyer by profession, and um, I remember when the Nazis tried to march in Skokie, which was a northern suburb of Chicago, and... The Supreme Court ruled that it was their First Amendment right to have a march, even though they're Nazis. And my father's response was, he said, Nehemiah, we don't have free speech for popular ideas. We have free speech for the ideas that people hate. If we ban the Nazis today, 20 years from now, they're going to be banning us. And he actually told me this was how great America was that they even let the Nazis, now they can't attack you, they can't call for violence, that's not free speech. Kill the Jews is not free speech. But expressing yourself in a nonviolent way, that is the greatness of the American enterprise. And, and I remember my father, the rabbi, telling me, basically, it's wonderful the Nazis are marching in Skokie because it means they won't shut us down. Um, in 1263, there was a rabbi named Nachmanides, very famous rabbi, he became a, a famous Bible commentator. Even at the time, he was a famous Talmudic commentator. He was one of the great luminaries of the 13th century, and he was ordered by King James I of Aragon, uh, what we would call Spain, at the time it was just Aragon. He was ordered to appear in a disputation with a Jewish convert to Catholicism named Pablo Cristiani. The rabbi did not want to participate in this debate. This was not a debate he could win. If he uh, lost the debate, the Jews could be forced to convert to Catholicism. If he won the debate, the Jews could be killed. Some debate. He comes to the debate, and he says as follows, and I found this quote years ago, and it just really touched my heart, how this connects with the modern American idea, and not just American, Israeli as well. I'm a citizen of both the United States and Israel, and in Israel we have a concept of free speech. Uh, I'll be honest, not quite like you do in the United States. No one in the world has free speech like in the United States, uh, embedded in your constitution. But in Israel, we do have the foundation laws, and one of those foundation laws is chofash adibur, freedom of expression, freedom of speech. 1263, he, he writes, uh, well, he actually said this before the king, King James I of Aragon. He said, when his majesty the king ordered me to debate with Friar Pablo in his court, in his presence and in the presence of his counselors in Barcelona, I replied saying... I will do according to the commandment of my lord, the king. If you grant me permission to speak according to my desire, I want free speech. Why do I want free speech? You're making me debate. I got to be able to say whatever I want to say. I request the permission from the king and from Dominican friar Ramon de Peñafort and his associates present here. And that's really interesting. You have to understand the historical context there. The Dominican uh, friar, the, this Dominican leader, he wasn't just a monk, a pious monk. 
What the Dominicans would do in Spain and in many countries in Europe is they would whip up the Christian mob, the Catholic mob, to attack Jews. This guy's the head of Antifa of the 13th century. And what Mahmadis is saying is, you can give me permission all day long, king, but if the Dominicans don't give me permission, when I go home, they're going to kill me and my family and my friends. I mean, history doesn't change, does it? Friar Ramon answered, only on the condition that you do not speak offensive things. Bizionot in Hebrew. Well, how can I talk about religion and not say things that are offensive? There's no way I could even speak. <laughs> There's nothing I could say. Everything I say is going to be offensive. We're talking about, I mean, he was being forced to debate. Really, the question was, in essence, the question was, why is it you're a Jew? Your identity as a Jew is invalid. You need to be a Catholic. And the fact that you're a Jew, you need to defend that. That really was the question, the fundamental question. And he's saying, look, if I can't express myself, then, uh, then, then how, can I, how can I respond to this? Oh, well, only if you don't say things that are offensive. Well, it's the things that, offend, that are offensive that we need protection for. Those are the things that we need the freedom of speech for. And I love the response of Nachmanides. He goes on, he says, I said to them, I will speak everything that I desire in the matter of the disputation, just as you speak as you desire, although I intend to speak politely, but it, it will be whatever I desire to say. He's saying, look, I'm going to be a mensch. I'm not going to come up here and insult you, insult your religion, but the things I say will be inherently insulting to you and your religion. I'm not going out of my way to insult you, but I'm identifying myself as a Jew and why I'm a Jew, and there's no way I can do that without insulting a Catholic in the 13th century. It's really interesting if you read on in the disputation. There's two points in the disputation where he writes in Hebrew, Aniti kimahatel, I answered sarcastically. In other words, he's saying I'm going to be polite, but there's that Jewish sarcasm, which is part of our culture, and it it's, apparently has been part of our culture for since the 13th century. And once he's being sarcastic to Friar Pablo, who he's debating, second time he's being sarcastic to the king. That took some, some chutzpah. What it shows you is that free speech in the Jewish sense is a core value. We cannot express ourselves in our faith if we don't have that freedom of speech. And as a persecuted minority, we cherish that value of free speech. And it breaks my heart when I turn on the news and I turn and I open up Facebook and I see these attacks against free speech, particularly at the American universities. The universities should be the bastion of free speech. And instead, those are the places that are the most dangerous to express your identity if it's not the right identity. I mean, this is, this is tragic. Um, what came out of the disputation is, really underscores how important free speech is and how delicate free speech is. So, Nachmanides won the debate. And after the debate, Pablo Cristiani, the Jewish convert to Catholicism, he wrote down what happened and he lied. And so Nachmanides responded and he wrote a transcript of what happened, word for word. And he was sentenced to death by the Catholic Church. But you gave me free speech. Yes, you had freedom to speak, not to write. You could say whatever you want, but you can't post that on Facebook. Um, the king of Aragon, James I, uh, commuted his sentence from death to exile. And Nachmanides ended up becoming one of the Jews who returned to the land of Israel, reestablishing or helping to reestablish the Jewish presence after the, the Crusades had really wiped out the Jewish community. Um, in 1264 in Spain, they then begin the censorship of the Talmud. Why censor the Talmud? Well, we lost the debate. A hundred years from now, we want to win. So we better make sure the things in their books that cause us to lose the debate aren't in there. I mean, this is how fascists work. This is how totalitarians work. They um, won't let you say what you want to say, and then they say, oh, okay, you can say it, but then they find a way to persecute you anyway. Um, I, I really hope the United States turns around and that free, free speech is restored because what's, go, what's happening, it's a slippery slope. It can happen faster than you think. You think, oh, well, it'll never happen here. Those are famous last words, it'll never happen here. Those are what the Jews said in the Holocaust in Germany. 
Not in Germany. Germany is the home of literature and music. All of the great fine culture of the world. It'll never happen here. There's some crazy guy who's saying stuff now. He'll be gone in another four years or six years. How did that end? Not so well. Um, let me get to my, my main topic here. Years ago, I was at Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And they had just rearranged the, the museum and had new exhibits. And one of the things they had there was a quote from a rabbi. And it explained that this is something the rabbi said just before he went into the gas chambers. And, and, and in Jewish culture, when you understand what, what's being said here, this is such a powerful story. The rabbi said to the German SS commander, he says, do not think you will succeed in destroying the Jewish people. The Jewish people will live forever. When he had finished, he cried out emphatically, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. And all the Jews cried out with him, Shema Yisrael. And I remember seeing this in Yad Vashem, and my first reaction was, I mean, it touches your heart. If you understand the Jewish culture, this rabbi is about to walk into a gas chamber, or he's in the gas chamber, actually, and he's crying out the most precious words in the Jewish culture and in the Bible, Shema Yisrael. My next reaction, as someone who has a master's degree from Hebrew University and has studied ancient history, was this can't possibly be true. How could this be true? The great story. What a wonderful, power motiva powerful, motivating story, but it can't possibly be true. The rabbi's dead. Everybody who, who was there with him in the gas chamber is dead. How could anybody know this? And it began a journey for me of searching out to find out, is this true? And if it's true, how do we know it? And if it's not true, how would anybody dare to put this into the Yad Vashem Museum? Um, I really can't get into the details of this without giving like being really open about this. Um, my background as a Jew, in a sense, sets me up to be very sensitive to this topic. It's a sensitive topic. Here I am questioning part of the narrative of the Holocaust. When I was 17 years old in 1990, I went on a trip to Poland, and I visited Auschwitz. And this is me, believe it or not. This is me about, uh, well, many decades ago and pounds ago. That skinny little guy was me standing in Crema II, the second crematorium in Auschwitz. And I'm standing here in a place where 500,000 Jews were murdered in that very spot, in that building. So of course I'm sensitive about this. At the, on the other hand, it's just in my nature and in my training from Hebrew University to employ critical thinking. And I have to balance that out, my emotional attachment to the topic and my critical thinking and what I was trained to do at Hebrew University as a, really as a philologist, a philologist is somebody who uses language and history and the study of manuscripts to understand ancient texts and modern texts that can be used for that as well. So I, my critical thinking had to win out. Um, about a year ago, I was researching my family and I had always suspected someone in my family died in the Holocaust. I didn't know any details. I signed up for Ancestry.com and started clicking around and found out there was this database called the All Lithuania Database, where they were archiving all kinds of documents about Jews, not just in the Holocaust, but Jewish genealogy. And I found out that my great-grandmother, Fruma Robinson, who came to the United States in 1925, that she had a sister. I never knew this. I found her Polish citizenship application from 1923. And she never came to the United States. And as I was, continued to research, I, I found more information about her. I even found her picture. Her name was Fanny or Fega in Yiddish, Tzemel. She was my great, great aunt. And her husband, Yirmiyahu Tzemel, was my great, great uncle. So this is my grandmother's aunt. My grandmother's sister, my, sorry, my grandmother's mother's sister. I'd never heard of this woman. I asked my mother about her. She said, yeah, that was Aunt Fagy. We think she died in the Holocaust. We really don't know. She was in Europe before the Holocaust. We, don't, we never knew what happened to her. So I'm clicking around in this database and doing research, which is what I do. And I find there's a listing that mentions her and her husband. There she's called Fanny, which is the um, more secular form of Fega, which is the, the Yiddish form. Um, her husband was Yirmiyahu. They had a son named Nathan, 
And they had a granddaughter whose name is not known. And I found that all four of them were killed in the Holocaust. And um, their granddaughter, whose name we don't even know, was a little girl who was eight years old. And if you look there, it says, killed 1943, Ponar, daughter of Nathan Semmel. What's Ponar? Well, I knew exactly what that was. Ponar refers to the Ponari Forest outside of Vilna, Lithuania. Today it's known as Vilnius. And that's where the Jews were taken out, lined up in, over trenches and shot. And this wasn't a one-time event. This was a, a process over years. You know, we, we've got too many Jews in the ghetto. Let's shoot some more. Got in the shipment of bullets. Let's shoot some more. And they shot an eight-year-old girl. Well, I'm a guy who always wants to see the source. This is what I, I mean, really, uh, I tell people I was born and raised in Chicago and Illinois, but deep in my heart, I'm from Missouri, which is the show me state. So I'm seeing this document, and this is a modern thing, a database that was put together really in the last couple of years. And I say, how do they know this? And if you look there, they tell you. It says there, book by Schmerka Kutcher Ginsky, ITS archive and other sources. Okay. So I find there's actually references to this at Yad Vashem. They have testimonies of people who survived the Holocaust. But I wanted something a little bit more concrete. Who's this Shmerka Kaczerginski? So I research him and I find out he wrote a book called Chorban Vilna, or Chorban Vilna in Yiddish, The Destruction of Vilna. Vilna was the cultural capital of the Jewish people outside the land of Israel up until the Holocaust. In fact, it was called, and somewhat embarrassingly I have to say, it was called Yerushalayim Delita, the Jerusalem of Lithuania. I say embarrassingly because there should never be another Jerusalem. There's only one Jerusalem, the eternal capital of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. But, but culturally, outside the land of Israel, Vilna, Vilnius, was the center of the Jewish world, uh, of Jewish learning at the very least. And Kaczerginski was a partisan who lived out in the forests and I purchased this book online. It took me quite a long time to be able to even find it. Um, and then I had to hire someone to translate it because it was in Yiddish. And I got the translation five hours ago. I had no idea what it said. I knew, I knew my great-great-aunt was killed in the Holocaust, Fanny Tsemel and her husband, Yermiahu Tsemel. I didn't know the details. Five hours ago, I called up my mother who lives in Israel. It was around 9 p.m. in Israel. She lives in Jerusalem. I said, Mom, you know how we've talked about your Aunt Fagy, how she was killed in the Holocaust, and I found a reference to this in this modern database. Now I found out how she was killed. Do you want to know? This is one of the most difficult things I've ever done. I read to my mother the translation. I said, do you really want to know? Because I had read it 60 seconds earlier. She said, I really want to know. Tell me whatever it is. I've, we've wanted to know for decades. We knew she must have been killed because she knew where, where my grandmother lived and her sister. Her, she knew her sister lived in Chicago. Um, why didn't they contact us? She must have been dead. I'm going to read it to you. I got this five hours ago. So this is in the book, Chorben Vilna, 1947, pages 67 to 68. And this is a report that's identified there. It says, sent by Shaul Kaplan of Voronova. I'm going to use the Jewish pronunciation of these towns. Um, Voronova today is in Belarus. At the time, it was Bielorussia, uh, White Russia. And it was sent from Vilna, August 31st, 1944. When the slaughter of the Jews began in Lithuania, many of them fled to Belarus, to Voronova, 62 kilometers away from Vilna. In November 1941, the SS surrounded the village. They caught over 300 Lithuanian Jews, men, women, and children. They were confined in the village of Cinema, where they were shamefully tortured. In the village, there was a German communications company that used to come every evening to the cinema's lobby and go wild on the Jews. That's what it says in the Yiddish, apparently. And they gradually tortured them. The Germans used to come in and call, Who wants to go to the toilet? Those that asked to go were taken to the yard and shot. There were also events striking and crashing skulls using the butts of their rifles, leaving the Jews suffering until his end. A week later, they walked Jews out of the cinema to the railroad 
at the right side of the train station where they were shot. They forced the Jews to dig graves for the corpses at the same place. The confined Jews in the cinema were ordered to take off their shoes and their better clothing, whatever that means, um, and to hurry to the grave half naked in a frost of minus 15 degrees Celsius. Among the shot were the well-known Vilna teacher, Yirmiyah Hutzemel and his wife. When shooting, they often used explosive bullets so that many of the bodies were impossible to identify. And there it is, you can see it in the Yiddish. Yirmiyah Hutzemel mit der Frau, mit der Frau, with his wife. And I, I read this to my mother five hours ago. And until then, she had no idea how her great, her great aunt died. Um, I mean, imagine that. They, they knew she wasn't around. She must have been dead. And this was written in a book in 1947, but she didn't know that. How did I find it? We live in an information age where it's available at your fingertips. This is a miracle age we live in. That you can find out information that the woman's sister didn't know, that her niece didn't know, that her grandniece didn't know, that her... her I guess her great grand uh, nephew didn't know. Um, we now have this information that nobody knew for for over seventy years. Available. I mean, this is a blessing in a way, and in a way, it gave my mother today closure. She had no idea what happened to her great great aunt, to her great aunt, my great great aunt, and now we know. Um, I actually found out there's a photo of the Punari Forest of them shooting the Jews in Ponari. Um, this is where my cousin was killed. That is the granddaughter of Fanny Temel. Um, and I bring all this to say that I struggle as a scholar to be objective here. I honestly do. I want to have critical thinking and be objective and question as a critical scholar should question this story about the Shema Yisrael. But I have this emotional attachment. I can't get around that. So I think it's important to be honest about that emotional attachment. I mean, this is one of the things I see going on, in, particularly in the media. People will come out and pretend they're objective. And everyone knows they're not objective. Let's just be honest about it. Tell us what side you're on. Tell us what your biases are. And work to overcome those biases if you want to find truth. Um, I found out a few years back that I have Asperger's syndrome. And one of the characteristics of my Asperger's is I'm obsessed with the truth. Because most people would say, shut up, Nehemiah. We had the great story about the Shema. Just shut up. Stop questioning it. Don't ruin our story. And if you don't want to hear the rest of this, don't listen. That's fine. Turn it off on YouTube. But I'm going to investigate this and find out what the truth is. Because it, it's something I, I have a true love of the truth even when it's uncomfortable. Now, why was I so skeptical about the Shema Yisrael story? I want to give you the background here. Some of you may know this. The rabbi said, as he's in the gas chamber, do not think you will succeed in destroying the Jewish people. The Jewish people will live forever. When he had finished, he cried out Shema Yisrael. And all the Jews cried out Shema Yisrael. What is a Shema Yisrael? Hear, O Israel. The Shema Yisrael, what we refer to in Judaism as Shema Yisrael, is really three passages which are combined together as a prayer. And many Jews recite this prayer twice a day. It's Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21, and Numbers 15, 37 to 41. Many Jews recite the Shema twice a day. Many Jews recite it a third time just before they go to sleep. That's called Kriyat Shema Alamita, reciting the Shema over the bed. It's the nighttime, and especially children, who don't really go to prayer services. You know, Jews go to prayer services uh, traditionally two to three times a day. My father went three times a day, or at least he prayed three times a day. Uh, went to two formal services certainly every day. Um, the children who don't do that, their parents take them to the bed and they recite the Shema with them, word after word. Shema Yisrael. Word after word. And this is the prayer. Shema Yisrael. And traditionally, this is read Adonai, the Lord. In Hebrew, it has the name. I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but I have been given free speech here. 
Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad, Hero Israel, Yehovah is our God, Yehovah is one. The earliest copy of the Shema is the Nash Papyrus from 150 BC. It was discovered in Egypt. Before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, this was the oldest known biblical text at all. Uh, now we have much older biblical texts or copies of biblical texts. And I don't know if you can see it. It's not so easy to see. Um, but if you look here, use my little laser pointer. Is that on? Yes. So that is the Lamed of Yisrael, of Shema Yisrael. We don't have the word Shema, actually. Uh, that is the name Yud. Everybody with me? Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. That's what scholars call the Tetragrammaton. In Judaism, we usually call that Shem HaMiforash, the explicit name or the unequivocal name, also known as Shem HaMiuchad, the unique name, the four-letter name of God. It says there, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. That's the oldest known copy, currently known copy, of the Shema. Um, we only have the first verse. Uh, I guess we have part of the second verse. It goes on, And you will love Yehovah with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. And you will teach them to your children. And you will speak about them. These are the words of the Torah, the five books of Moses. When you sit in your house and you walk on your way, and when you lie down and when you get up. And this is why many Jews for thousands of years, every morning and every evening have recited the Shema. Because it says when you lie down and when you get up. And they said, maybe not literally when I lie down, but sometime in the evening. And maybe not literally when I get up, but sometime in the morning. And this is so deeply ingrained in the Jewish culture, this idea of reciting the Shema. The words that that rabbi were told spoke just before he was killed at Auschwitz, it's so deeply ingrained that the opening passage of the Talmud, the Talmud is the repository of rabbinical learning. In some sense, it's the encyclopedia of ancient Judaism. The opening words of the Talmud are, Me'ematai korin et shema be'aravin. From when do we recite the Shema in the evening? There's no question that we recite the Shema. Nobody discusses that. Everyone knows you recite the Shema in the evening. The question is, when, from when are you allowed to first recite the Shema? Right? It says when you lie down. Okay. Well, what time do you go to sleep? From sunset can I recite it? And then there's a great discussion there that ensues where there's a debate between rabbis about, okay, we agree when you can start reciting it, but how long are you allowed to recite it? Can you recite it until sunrise? And then there's a great story about the children of Rabbi Rabban Gamliel, that's Gamaliel II. He's the grandson of the Gamaliel mentioned in the New Testament. And uh, it talks about how his children were in a tavern until very late at night. And they came home to their father and said, can we still recite the Shema? It's great. great. Like you feel like the, um, the experience, the Jewish experience of ancient times. This was an important question. Really, it wasn't a question about reciting the Shema, but how, how, when, the parameters of when you could recite the Shema, that was something that Jews were debating. Of course, the Shema makes an appearance in the New Testament. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. And one of the scribes came and asked Yeshua, which is the first commandment of all? And Yeshua answered him, the first of all commandments is, Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's just kind of a paraphrase in this English. And thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. This is the first commandment. What's really interesting here is the scribe hears this answer and he's like, okay, I'm satisfied. You've spoken something that's authentically Jewish that I hear and I cannot dispute. There's no disputing the Shema. Remember, even in the Talmud, you could dispute the parameters of it, but you can't dispute inherently the Shema. The Shema makes another appearance in Jewish history in the story, a very famous story in Jewish culture of the martyrdom of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was the leading rabbi uh, during the Bar Kokhba revolt, which took place between 132 and 135 CE. 
It was a Jewish revolt against the Romans. It was really the third in the series of revolts. And Rabbi Akiva is executed eventually by the Romans, skinned alive. And we have an account of his martyrdom. When they brought forth Rabbi Akiva for execution, it was the time for reciting the Shema. There we have it, the Shema, in the execution of the leading rabbi in the early 2nd century. As the Romans were combing his flesh with iron combs, he was receiving upon himself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. Now in Hebrew, that phrase, Kabbalat ol malchut shamayim, receiving upon oneself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, yoke in the sense of an ox that puts a yoke on its neck, that means he was reciting the Shema. How do you get that, reciting the Shema? Because when you say, Hero Israel, Yehovah is our God, Yehovah is one, you're accepting upon yourself God in heaven as your God, as your king. The story goes on. Rabbi Akiva's disciples said to him, Even now? You're reciting the Shema now? As they're combing your skin with iron combs? He said to them, all my days I was troubled by the verse, with all your soul. Which means even if it cost you your life. I said to myself, when will I have the opportunity to fulfill this? And now that I have the opportunity, should I not fulfill it? And these are some of the most famous words in rabbinical literature. He elongated his pronunciation of echad until his soul left him. The last word on his mouth, last words were the Shema, and the last word was one, proclaiming the oneness of the God of Israel. And what's really interesting, my, my father, he knew this story. Everyone knows this story, and, and certainly in the Orthodox Jewish world, and they walk it out in their lives. How do they walk it out? When my father would recite the Shema, he would take off his glasses, he would put his hand over his eyes, and he would say, Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And he would actually do it like that, elongating the Dalid in the manner of Rabbi Akiva. Of course, I study ancient Hebrew texts and the ancient Hebrew language. And when I read this, I say, that doesn't make any sense. You can't elongate a duh. It doesn't make any sense linguistically, phonologically, and, and phonologically. Of course, Anybody who studies ancient Hebrew knows there are six letters in the Hebrew language that have two forms. We call them the Beged Kefet letters. Bet, Gimel, Dalad, Kaf, Pei, Tav. When they have a dagesh, a dot in the letter, we have a hard form of the letter. B for bet. When there's no dot in it, there's a soft form, V. Well, what's the soft form of Dalad? Well, we know that because some Jewish communities preserved it. And the soft form of Dalad is the. And so Rabbi Akiva didn't say echad like my father. He said echad as the life went out of his body. And so here we have an example where understanding the ancient Hebrew language can help us. In, I mean, here's a testimony that tells us this is how they spoke, the way that's preserved by a Jewish community even today. Um, the Shema didn't end in Jewish culture with Rabbi Akiva. There was the German Crusade of 1096. In the German Crusade of 1096, the Pope, Pope Urban II had called for a crusade for the Catholics to go to the Holy Land and liberate Jerusalem. And many of the people said, why would we go all the way to the Holy Land when we have heathens in our midst? First, let's wipe out the heathens among us before we go and wipe out the heathens over there. And they wiped out three major Jewish communities, Spire, Verms, and Mines. Those were the three major Jewish communities in uh, what today is Germany. Um, just to give you an idea of how important these were as Jewish cultural centers, Rashi, the famous rabbi, went to study in Spire and then in Verms before he returned to his homeland in, in France. In Judaism, these are called Gzeot Tatnu. Most people don't know the details, but many Jews know the general picture that the Catholics would surround the Jewish synagogues, demand that the Jews be baptized, and rather than uh, profess, profess the Catholic faith, these Jews were martyred. 
And many of them recited the Shema. And why the Shema of all things? One, they remembered the story of Rabbi Akiva. But more importantly, as they were being asked to profess a doctrine which they felt did not honor the oneness of God. And so the Shema was their way of saying, look, we're going to die for the oneness of God. And many, many Jews died reciting the Shema during the Gzerot Tatnu, the mass German crusade of 1096. And more importantly, as this is remembered in the Jew Jewish collective consciousness. Now, that was a thousand years ago. My critical thinking is a bit skeptical. Do we know for sure that happened? It may have. I looked for contemporary documents that describe this. They may exist, but I couldn't find them. And I'll admit, I might just need to look harder. There's a modern instance of the Shema being recited, which is indisputable because it happened in the internet age. There was a man named Major E. Klein in the Second Lebanon War. He wasn't a soldier. He was a father with two children, little beautiful children, and he was called up for reserve duty. He was the second in command of the 51st Golani Brigade, or sorry, the 51st Golani Battalion, which is a, a mechanized infantry brigade. In the Battle of Binch Bell in Lebanon, a Lebanese terrorist on July 26, 2006, threw a grenade in among him and his men. He jumped on it, covered it with stomach, and his men reported that as he was dying, he recited Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. This is not some story that you can question. It's in the internet age. There were many witnesses who testified about it. We've got some other stories about the Shema. And these I, I'm extremely skeptical of. I don't know that they happened. I honestly don't know. I have to be critical. I'm a critical thinker. It's what I do. <laughs> um... This story is told about three separate rabbis, which already raises a red flag. And the story is, and in general, the story is true. Uh, whether this specifically happened, I don't know. What happened is many Jews survived the Holocaust as babies, as children, by being handed over to orphanages run by Catholic nuns and monks. And after the war, the Jews went and said, okay, can you give us our children back? And they said, show us some documentation. There was no documentation. Bring their parents. The parents are dead, or we don't know where they are. So the story is that these rabbis went to the orphanages, and they started crying out the Shema, singing the Shema, Shema Yisrael. And the children in their, in their bunks as they were being put to sleep started crying, the ones who were Jews because they remembered their parents reciting the Shema with them as little children. Now, did that actually happen? I really want to believe it happened. I couldn't find any solid documentation that it happened. I found a lot of stories written decades later, and I'm not saying it didn't happen. Um, I'm just saying that, for me, this remains a question mark. And this is how I approach the story of Rabbi Moshe Friedman the Boyana Rebbe, who prior to being murdered in the gas chambers, cried out the Shema. You understand why I'm skeptical? This is your archetypal martyrdom story. And that should make you skeptical. It should make you have some critical thinking. And really the reason I had the critical thinking is I couldn't understand who reported this event. Everyone was killed. The rabbi was killed. Everyone in the gas chamber was killed. I couldn't believe the SS officers reported this. It doesn't make sense. Even if they heard it, they wouldn't have known necessarily what it was. The only people who could have reported this were what were known as the Zunderkommandos. I knew this. The Zunderkommandos, that's the German word that means special squads. Those were the Jews who were pressed into slavery to clean the bodies out of the gas chambers and do some worse things that I'll... I don't know if I'll say. Um, I had assumed all the Zonder Commando were killed. And so surely they didn't report this. And what I discovered is, first of all, there were approximately 2,000 Zonder Commando and 30 of them survived. In addition to that, some of the Zonder Commando wrote down what happened 
during the events as they were happening and hid their documents, their diaries and their reports among the human ashes and bones that they were forced to, to create. You know, their job was to burn the bodies, grind up the bones into ash, and eventually toss the ashes into the Vistula River to hide the crime that had been done. And they knew they were going to be killed. And why were they going to be killed? Because if, if the Nazis lost the war, they knew there'd be trials and they'd be held accountable. And so the first thing you do is you kill the witnesses. There's two um, really good movies about the Zunderkommando. And I got to say, I did most of the research on this topic before I knew about these movies. I was reading academic journals and uh, uh, articles in Hebrew and all kinds of um, firsthand documents and um, studies about the, the scrolls of Auschwitz in which the Zunderkommando recorded the events. And I didn't even know about these movies. And, and what's interesting is, you know, the movies, um, as a scholar, I kind of look down on movies. Um, <laughs> this is not a serious source of historical information, but what it did is through art, it brought to life many of the things I had been reading. In fact, some of the events described in the scrolls of Auschwitz became the storyboard for these movies, became the outline for these movies. I mean, it actually blew me away when I, particularly the son of Saul, which won an Academy Award. It's a movie in Hungarian with subtitles. And it won, I believe, the best foreign film or something like that. Um, the Gray Zone, honestly, isn't the best movie ever. Um, it has a relatively negative portrayal of the Zonderkommando, the Gray Zone. And it's true, some of the Zonderkommando maybe weren't the best people. Um, but other ones are heroes. And, and I want to... This next part is difficult. And you might say, wait, it been, hasn't been difficult until now? This is really difficult, the next part. There was a Zunderkommando, and look, if, if you need to get up and leave, no problem. And if you're watching on YouTube, this is, may not be for children. Um, one of the Zunderkommandos who survived was a, a, an artist named David Oler, and he made a series of drawings showing the work he did. Now remember, these guys' job was to go, I mean, they had a number of jobs. One is they were required. Basically, these people were taken when they arrived at Auschwitz, separated from their families, sent into a bunk, and told, your families have been killed. Your job now will be to burn their bodies. These people thought they were coming on a work detail. Many of them knew they weren't. But some of them were deluded into believing they were coming to work. They were told by the Nazis, Jews are lazy. We're going to put you to work. In the east, put you on a train. They arrive on the train, and in less than 24 hours, they're burning their families' bodies. And they're not just burning the bodies. The Germans didn't want anything to go to waste. So they stripped the people naked before they sent them into the gas chambers to recycle the clothing. They cut their hair after they were dead, the women's hair. They pulled out gold teeth. Well, the Germans weren't going to do that. It was the Zunderkommando who did those things. It was the Zunderkommando who were assigned to pull the teeth out. They had a German guard watching over them who was drunk most of the time. Um, this is one of the paintings or drawings of David Oler, the undressing room. He did this in 1946, which is really significant because this is a year after the war. Right? You could say 40 years later. Did he really remember that? Did he remember if the door is on the right side or the left side? Okay, maybe not. But a year after the war, this guy, he's not going to forget um, this next painting is uh, called In the Gas Chamber. And that's the SS officer standing at the door. Of course, these Jews weren't told we're sending you to the gas chamber. The Jews were told, at least by the Germans, we're sending you to be deloused before we put you to work. There's soup waiting for you. There's hot coffee. Let's get over it. Let's do it quick. Take your clothes off and put them on a hook. And remember the hook number. You're coming back for your clothes. One of the descriptions is by a man named Leib Langfus. He did not survive the war. He wrote down what was happening during the war, during the Holocaust. This is one of the men who worked in the gas chambers removing the bodies. And he described his first experience just after arriving at Auschwitz. 
what it was like to go into the gas chamber after the people were dead. He says, falling down dead in such a confined space, the people pressed against each other in five or six layers, one on top of the other to over a meter in height. Mothers were left sitting on the ground clutching their children, men and women hugging each other. Some were stu stuck in a bent-over posture on account of the mass. You know, they were all smashed together. and They couldn't even... The legs standing up and from the waist up lying down. Some were left completely blue under the effect of the gas and some completely fresh as if sleeping. One group did not go into the bunker. In other words, a, a train arrived and they didn't have enough room in the gas chambers to kill all the Jews at once. They were held in a wooden hut until 11 in the morning the next morning. They heard the despairing voices of the people being gassed and worked out exactly what was awaiting them. They witnessed everything. As I later found out, my wife and son were among them. Wow. So this was the life of us under commando. And I, one of the reasons I bring this is in the literature on the Holocaust, the Zunderkommando are often uh, vilified as these cult. In fact, I was telling my mother about this earlier today and explained to her what the Zunderkommando was, and she said, oh, you mean collaborators. I don't know that that's fair. What would you do if you were pulled off a train, told, we just killed your family, if you want to live? You probably won't live more than three days anyway. That's what they told them, two or three days. But it, the only reason you're alive is because your job now is to burn bodies and pull teeth cut hair. What would you do? And some of these people in the Zunder Commando were bad people, but some of them were true heroes. There was a man named Zalman Leventhal who was also killed, but he wrote his documents. Um, he wrote what happened. His document was discovered in 1962. I call it number eight because there were nine caches of documents. I'll get to that in a bit. He wrote, when the Zunder Commando set to work, many of them recognized members of their families among the dead, as his commando was made up of men who had just arrived. They were mur thus were murdered all the population of our settlement. All our community, our town, our dear parents, our wives, our children, our sisters, our brothers, on 10th December 1942, late at night, the rest were killed in the next day. It's very similar to the other description, right? They were over or meaning they were over capacity in the killing. They were doing so much killing, they didn't have room in the gas chambers, especially early on. They got more efficient with time. This next image is of David O'Leary. This is a very difficult image, but this is what it meant to remove the bodies from the gas chambers. If you don't want to watch, close your eyes for a few seconds. This is what the life of the Zunder Commando was. And imagine that's your wife and your son. Um, they then took the bodies to an elevator, brought them up the elevator, and then there were ovens where they burned the bodies. And again, this is David O'Leary, 1950, The Oven Room. Now, you could read about this all day long until you see an image of it. It's, it's, it was hard for me to um, understand, so what did this really involve? And then I found these drawings, and, and then these drawings are the storyboards for those two movies. They're based on these drawings and other documents. Um, there was a Zunder Commando who survived named Yakov Freemark, and he wrote, he wrote about Zalman Gradovsky, who we're going to hear a little bit more about. Zalman Grudowski was a very devout Jew who was pressed into service as a slave in the Zunder Commando. After the cremation of each shipment of Jews, Zalman Grudowski would return to the block, wrap himself in his talit, his prayer shawl, put on his phylacteries to his fill in and say Kaddish for the souls of the victims. Kaddish is the prayer over the dead. He wept for the holy books, prayer shawls, and phylacteries which had been burned. This was a man who didn't want to be doing this. He did this so he could live another day and another day and so he could tell people what happened. That was the goal of many of the Zunder Commando, to let the world know what happened. And they knew they were going to be killed and he was killed, Zalman Grudowski, but he wrote down what happened. And we have those. Those are called the Scrolls of Auschwitz. We have those documents. They exist. There was a Zunder Commando named Philip Miller who was one of the 30 or so who survived. He tells the story of how at one point he decided to commit suicide. He walked into the gas chamber. And the people in the gas chamber said to him, We understand that you have chosen to die with us. We think your decision is pointless. Return to the camp and tell everybody about our last hours. Perhaps you'll survive this terrible tragedy, and then you must tell everybody what happened. This man was given a solemn duty. 
That solemn duty was to survive whatever it took so he could tell the world what happened. And he did. He wrote a book about it, explaining what happened. And it's an invaluable historical document, his book. Um, we have different types of documents. You know, in history, you, you learn there's different types of documents. There's documents that are written years later. His book was written in the 1970s, decades after the war, after the Holocaust. Um, one of those under commando was a man that we didn't survive. We only know him as Alex the Greek. Alex the Greek was killed. But before he was killed, he took the only photos that exist of the extermination process in Auschwitz. He took four photos. One of them's black. You can't see anything. One of them is naked women being taken to their deaths. I won't show you that. The two other photos are the Zunderkommando out in the open burning the bodies. They had run out of room in the crematoriums. There was no more room in the oven, so they were burning the bodies in the open air. And this is the photo. Um, in the movie, uh, Son of Saul, they recreate Alex the Greek taking this photo. It's... You could look at this photo and, and imagine what this man had to go through. His job was to drag the bodies and burn them and grind them to dust and pull out teeth. Where does he get a camera from? I'll tell you where he got a camera from. People came with luggage and the Nazis said, mark your name on the luggage. You'll be coming back for it. And then they took the luggage and they sent things back to Germany. Well, one of the Jews whose job it was, this was an area of Auschwitz that the Jews called Canada which in the, in the Jewish mind meant great riches. And this area called Canada, they would, they would go through the luggage. And somebody found a camera and smuggled it to the Zonderkommando. This wasn't an individual act. This was a group act. To make sure the world knew what was happening, at least in the future they would find out. And these are the only four photos of the extermination process at Auschwitz. We have photos from the uh, selection process, a few of those. But these are, I mean, this is an incredible document. You know, I'm talking about the scrolls of Auschwitz, but I don't want to discount this, which in a sense is a scroll as well. It's not written, but it's, it's an invaluable document of history. Um, this is one of the nine caches of scrolls. This is, uh, contains two different documents. And that's interesting. There are nine caches, but the way I count them, 11 different scrolls. And I didn't name them scrolls. Scholars have named them scrolls, I guess because they were rolled up but also presumably because of the association with the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were just coming out at the time these were discovered. Um, this cache in 19, in, in, discovered in 1962, and it contained documents of Zalman Leventhal and Leib Langfus. Um, this is the last one to be discovered in 1980. And, and here you can see very clearly it was in some kind of a thermos, some kind of metal thermos that's decayed. And that thermos was put inside of a leather suitcase, or briefcase, rather. And it contained a letter in Greek by a Zunder commander named Marcel Najari, a Jewish uh, man from Greece. And he was a Jewish national, uh, Greek nationalist. He famously wrote the name of Greece in Greek, Halos, in capital letters in his letter. He was very proud of being a Greek. But to the Germans, he was just a Jew and needed to die. Um, this is cache number six, 1952, Leib Langfus. This is the one that we're going to be coming back to because this is the one that has the story about Shema Yisrael. This one is cache number seven. It was discovered in 1961. It wasn't written at Auschwitz. Two of the 11 documents were written in the Lodz ghetto. Lodz was a Jewish community, um, and the ghettos were places where they massed Jews from all over, to, hopefully to starve them to death. That was the plan of the Nazis that the Jews would die of disease and, um, and starvation. And if they didn't die of, die of disease and starvation, there was always Auschwitz, right? But, you know, you want to save some gas. That was the way the Nazis thought. Save the train space, if you can. Well, two of those people from Lodz both in, separately ended up at Auschwitz, and their diaries were discovered. And this one's really moving to me. This is the diary of a little girl, or possibly a young man, and it's written in four different languages. Polish. German, Yiddish, and English. And we can actually read this. We have to love good times in the ghetto. We can get some cabbage with what to lessen our mortal hunger. That's a Yiddish expression, with what to lessen. 
The only care is about our future, the nearest future, because everyone is concerned that the war is decidedly approaching its end. Fears are aroused by rumors according to which the Germans destroyed tens of thousands of Hungarian Jews. It was over 500,000. She didn't know that. When will this question of to be or not to be be taken off our shoulders? She's quoting Shakespeare in English. And this little girl was taken to Auschwitz, and, and the belief is that, um, actually, th sorry, this instance we actually know who discovered it. Uh, presumably, um, when they were stripped of their clothing, she may have had this in her pocket or in a small bag. It was discovered by one of the Zunderkommando who buried it along with a commentary. He explains, I found this, and, he, and he's commenting on it. It's incredible that we have, I mean, their, their sense of history Facing impending doom is, is just beyond imagine. I mean, it's beyond comprehension. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a historical outline here very quickly. October 7th, 1944 was the Zunderkommando uprising. On that day, the Zunderkommando decided, and they had been planning this for many, many, many months. They had been smuggling explosives. Um, there were Jews who were used as slave labor in a munitions factory, particularly three women who smuggled out uh, explosives that they handed off to the Zunderkommando. They were later raped and hanged, those three women. The Zunderkommando managed to blow up one of the crematoria. And the word crematorium is a bit of a, um, maybe, euphemism. It had ovens for burning people, but it also had the undressing room, and it had what's called the gas bunker, the gas chamber. So it wasn't just a place for burning bodies. So they realized if we blow this up, maybe it'll slow down the murder. Um, they managed to kill three SS officers. 400 Zunderkommando were killed. January 18, 1945, the uh, Nazis decide to abandon Auschwitz, by and large, and they deport thousands of Jews. Why take the Jews with you when you're leaving? Well, it's slave labor. We got factories to man. What are you talking about? And we got people to kill. I mean, imagine what the Nazis could have done if they had used those trains to, to transfer weapons and supplies. But they were so obsessed with killing the Jews that they were willing to let it harm their, their military effort. Uh, and this wasn't an isolated incident. This was a pattern for, for several years. January 27, 1945, Auschwitz is liberated by the Soviet Red Army. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through the nine caches just so you get an idea of what was discovered and when. Most of them were discovered in 1945. One of the reasons I'm going through this is it's really hard to get information on this topic. I started with this book called The Scrolls of Auschwitz, and it talked about six different scrolls. Okay, there's only six. There's a book from a few years ago that mentions eight. I find out there's nine. There might be more than nine. Right? I only know about nine. The first one is late January, possibly early February, 1945. There's a Red Army doctor. Her name is Zenaida Beres... Berezovskaya. She finds the diary of a young Jewish girl named Rifka Lipschitz from the Lodz Ghetto near the crematorium at Auschwitz. It's just on the ground. Now, this isn't the diary we read from. It's a different little girl from, from Lodz. It's only turned over by her granddaughter in 2012. Imagine that. She put this in an attic somewhere and her son put it in an attic somewhere or wherever in a drawer and her granddaughter moves to San Francisco. Her granddaughter's not Jewish and she looks at this document that she got from her grandmother and says, I wonder if the Jews would be interested in this. She contacts the Jewish Community Center in San Francisco and uh, they said, well, we got to authenticate if this is real. This doesn't sound like it's real. And it was real. So the first one to be discovered is the last one to come to light. Second one is February 1945. Andrzej Zarski is 21-year-old doctor from Poland. He describes how he came out to walking among the crematoria and he sees Polish villagers pillaging, the, um, digging through the piles of human ash and bones. Why would they do that? Because they assumed the Jews had hidden gold among those piles. They didn't find gold, but they probably found some documents which we'll never see because they were destroyed because they said, oh, we don't, that's no, not valuable. 
he scares them off and he finds a letter written in French by a man named Chaim Hermann. And it's in a glass bottle, which is really interesting. Why is it in a glass bottle? Because the plan was to dump the ashes into the Vistula River. And he figured this would be washed down and someone downriver would find it. Well, the Nazis didn't have the time to dump this particular ash pile, or they missed it. May 5th, 1945. This is, a, to me, one of the most moving uh, instances. Shlomo Dragon was a Zonderkommando himself, who escaped on January 18th. He was taken in the transport from Auschwitz and escaped from the transport in January. He then goes back four months later to Auschwitz to dig up one of the documents. He knew that his brothers, his fellows under commando, had hidden documents, and he went there specifically to dig them up. And he digs up the document of Zalman Gradovsky near crematorium number two. That was the man that would put on his fillin and pray for the souls of the dead. Early 1945, we don't know exactly when, an unknown Polish man finds documents and sells them to a Jew who's from Auschwitz, and he's about to leave for Israel. And it turns out it's a letter from Grauman Gradovsky, a second document from the same man. Uh, and it's a letter where in the letter he says, please send this to my family in New York. And the man sends it to his family in New York. Can you imagine? You open up the mail one day, and there's a letter that was written in Auschwitz by a man who knew he was going to be killed, and he's essentially writing as a dead man. I mean, this is, how come I don't know about this? How come this isn't taught in schools? Um, 1952, sorry, April 1945, Gustav Borovchik, he finds the deportation, which is a, a long document written, many, many pages, by Le Blancfus at Birkenau. He puts it in his attic until 1970. Incredible. 1952, a man whose name I can't pronounce, Franciszek Ledvin, he's cutting the grass. And as he's cutting the grass, it turns up this document from Leib Longfus, the one that actually mentions the Shema that we'll get to. Unbelievable. July 28th, 1961 is an anonymous diary from the Lodge Ghetto. That's the uh, one that we read with the information, the, where it's written in English part of it. How did she know English? Well, my great-grandfather, when he came to the United States, it says at Ellis Island, he spoke English. He spoke, you know, Polish, English, Yiddish, Russian. That wasn't unusual in, of the Jews of that era, era, uh, area. Many of them had family in the United States, and they corresponded with them. Her English is British English, so she may have had family in England. October 17, 1962, Leventhal's Diary plus Loose Papers of Leib Longfus. And finally, October 24, 1980, Students Cutting Grass Near Crematorium 3. These are forestry students from a forestry college who every year would come to volunteer at Auschwitz because it's in a uh, forested area, and they don't want it to be over, overrun by, by trees. So they come and they pull up shrubs and they cut grass and they you know, do what forestry people do. And they find this letter of Marcel Najari written in Greek. So these are the um, nine authors of 11 documents. And when I bring the quotes at the top, I put the number of the cache in which they were found. Um, and you can see they were written in many different languages, Polish, Yiddish, Hebrew, French, English, German. There were Jews from all over Europe. What they had in common is they were Jews. Now, why do I call this the Lost Scrolls of Auschwitz? One reason I call it the Lost Scrolls is because they were lost and rediscovered. But, but there's another reason I call it that. Um, an archaeological excavation needs to be carried out at Auschwitz to find more documents. It is a crime against history that this has not been done. It was done in a very limited sense in the 60s. But this needs to be done. I don't know if they'll find anything decades later, but we won't know if we don't look. Zalman Leventhal wrote on October 10th, 1944, in a document discovered in 1962, he says, you will find more. And those dashes indicate sections where the mold has destroyed the page. We don't know what it says. Of the courtyard under the crematorium, not to the street, on the other side you will find many, because we must up till now until event in a chronological, historic manner to expose everything to the world. From now on, we will bury everything in the earth. There are dozens of documents that have never been discovered, and some might still be there. We don't know. 
Um, Zalman Gudrovsky on September 6th, oh, and I want to put this in context. What happened on October 7th, 1944? There was the uprising of the Zunderkommando. 400 of them were killed, 200 remained. He knew it was only a matter of time before they killed him. So that's what he's talking about. From now on, we're going to put everything in the earth because we know we're going to be killed any day. Up until then, they had tried to smuggle some documents out with the Polish underground. That wasn't going to happen after October 7th. So they decide they're going to, they had buried some things in the ground before. They're going to bury everything now. On September 6, 1944, before the uprising, he writes, Dear Finder, search all the grounds. Buried in them are dozens of documents. How clear can you be? Mine and those of others, which cast light on all that has happened here. The future will judge us on the basis of these writings. The world will learn from them, though it be only the smallest testimony of the tragic world in which we live. November 25th, 1944, Leib Longfus. Le Blancfus is a Dayan, a Dayan, Dayan. He is a, a rabbinical judge. He's the head of a Jewish community in a place called Makova. That's how the Jews pronounce it, Makova in Poland. He says, I would request that my various writings of the past signed with the initials AJRA and buried in jars and boxes in the courtyard of crematorium number two be collected, as well as the two larger writings, one titled The Deportation, hidden in the bone pit of crematorium number one. That was actually found, the deportation. And another entitled Auschwitz, which has never been found, was hidden in a heap of bones in the southwest side of that courtyard. No one's ever gone to look for those. How can that be? I later recopied them and completed them, and they were separately buried in the ashes of crematorium number two. I would request that they be edited and published together under the title The Horrors of Murder. These people were given a solemn... They were charged with a solemn duty by the people in the gas chambers. You have to tell the world what's happening. And they did whatever they could to tell the world. And they buried documents describing what happened. And we haven't found all of those documents. We haven't even looked. This is a crime against history, in my opinion. The very next day, Le Blancfuss writes, we are now going to the sauna. The sauna was the euphemism for the gas chamber. The 170 remaining men, we are convinced that they are taking us to our death. And he was right. They have selected 30 men to remain in crematorium number four. Today is 26 November 1944. And this is actually the original. And you can see he scrawled it on the side, sideways. I mean, he maybe had 30 seconds. He's, you know, they say, we're, we're coming to take you to the sauna. And he scribbles it down and puts it somewhere. And somebody else must have hidden it, have buried it. He couldn't have buried it, I don't think. Incredible. So Leib Longfus is was really an incredible man. Um, he was a religious man. Like I told you, he was a Dayan, which is, is kind of like a rabbi. He was the religious leader of a community in Poland. And he has the series of stories of accounts that happened over a period of several years that he calls the particulars, and which could also be translated the individuals. He writes, end of summer 1944, a transport arrived from Slovakia, a transport meeting of Jews. The arrivals knew without a doubt they were being taken to their death. Nevertheless, they were calm. They undressed and entered the bunker. As they were leaving the dressing room and entered the gas bunker, a woman said, maybe a miracle will still happen with us. And I don't know if it fully conveys the power of that. This was written in Yiddish, but Yiddish has many Hebrew words, and the Hebrew word here is nes. He says, maybe a nest will happen with us. And I can hear my grandmother saying those words in her Yiddish accent. I mean, I read that and I, I, I was in tears because the hope of this woman, she stripped naked walking into the gas chamber and she says, maybe a miracle will still happen with us. I still have faith in God. Wow. Another group of Jews had arrived from Tarnov, one of the, which is in Poland. One of the young people sat on a bench and asked for everyone's attention. A deathly silence prevailed. My Jewish brothers, he called out, do not believe that they are taking you to your death. It is unthinkable that this can happen to us, that tens of thousands of innocent men will be put to death. It was millions. Such cruel and shocking slaughter could never happen in this world. Those who told you those things must have had their reasons. Fear mongers, hate mongers. Those were the ones who told you that the Germans are going to kill us. This is a man standing naked 
sitting naked in the undressing room just outside the gas chamber. Guys, we got nothing to worry about. The Germans are the most civilized people in the world. This is what Jews believed, and it was kind of true before the war. He continued to speak until he had calmed down. Only when the gas was thrown into the bunker did the preacher with the well-developed conscience awaken from the dream of innocence. The pretext that he had used to calm his brothers were shown to be mere illusion and self-deception. And I think it's so important to understand this. I only read this very recently when I was researching these scrolls of Auschwitz. But this sense that we've been told in the past, don't worry, this will pass. Every Jew knows that. This will pass. Hitler's a nut. There'll be another, another chancellor in a few years. Don't worry about it. This too will pass. And it didn't just pass. Six million Jews were murdered. And I think it's key to understand that if you want to understand the geopolitical situation in the world today between Israel and, and particularly Iran, here's a, a tweet from Ayatollah Khamenei, who is the actual ruler of Iran. He's the religious ruler of Iran. For some reason, this wasn't considered a violation of Twitter's terms of service. I can't quite understand that. Ayatollah Khamenei, Israel is a hideous entity in the Middle East, which will undoubtedly be annihilated. No Jew can hear that and know what happened in the Holocaust and say, oh, we got a piece of paper. Don't worry about it. We're they won't do that. They're rational actors. What are you worried about? The people who are making you worry must have their reasons. We've heard that before. We can't take that risk. You can understand that, I hope. Le Blancfus goes on in the particulars. He says, end of summer 1943, a group of Poles from the immediate vicinity was brought to the camp. All its members, including 12 young women, were members of the underground organization. These are not Jews. These are Polish Catholics. At the same time, several hundred Dutch Jews from among the camp inmates were brought to be killed by gas. This is an incredible account here. In the gas bunker, totally naked, a young Polish woman made an impassioned speech against the German murderers. The Poles then knelt and formally, in an impressive pose, whispered a prayer. Remember, this is a rabbi writing about Catholic women. He doesn't say, oh, well, they're Catholics. God doesn't hear them. He sees them as women of faith, standing before their creator, literally naked, about to die. And he's moved by their faith. Still on their knees, they sang the Polish national anthem in chorus. The Jews sang Hatikva. Hatikva, many of you know, is the national anthem of the state of Israel. There's no state of Israel in 1944, 1943. Before the state of Israel, this was the anthem of the Jewish people. He goes on, their common cruel fate joined in that cursed place. I mean, this is incredible the way he writes. Imagine him writing this. He has to get paper from Canada and he had, you know, meaning from the place where they were redistributing, I should say redistributing, the place where the Nazis were pillaging the Jewish possessions. The people came with suitcases and somebody smuggled for Leib Longfuss a notebook and a pen. And he's writing this in a notebook with a pen that was stolen, that was smuggled in for him. And he's writing poetry. Every moment he's in danger of death and he's writing high literature. This is incredible. Their common cruel fate joined in that cursed place, the lyric note of the two anthems, so different from one another, meaning the Polish anthem and the Jewish anthem. Movingly and heartily, they expressed their last emotions and their consolation in the hope of their people's future. That's a play on words with Hatikva, obviously. The, me, mean the Jewish national anthem, Hatikva, means the hope. The gas was thrown into the bunker. They passed away in the midst of their song, born on the wings of a dream of brotherhood in a better world. I could sit down with my computer and I couldn't write that well. And this guy is writing at night. He's, if he's caught, he's going to be killed, in danger every moment, and he's writing fine literature. Hatikva, the hope, the song, says, as long as in the heart within, a Jewish soul still yearns, I mean, these are the words that were sung at Auschwitz. That's, this is what, and they're still sung today by the state of Israel. Towards the end of the East, an eye still gazes towards Zion. 
Our hope is not yet lost. The 2,000-year hope to be a free nation in our land, the land of Zion and Jerusalem, and the Jews are naked in the gas chamber and they're singing about their hope. They have no hope individually, but they know we as a people have a hope. That's what they're singing about. The hope that God won't forget us and as a people we will survive. And one of the things you see in, in, in Lev Langfuss's um, diaries and his scrolls is these um, religious references to a miracle, the confession of these Catholic women in their prayer. And he actually talks quite a bit about Jewish confession. We call it the vidui. And I think it's important to talk about this because I read a lot of books and articles about the scrolls of Auschwitz and I couldn't find anybody, at least in English, who talked about this. They glazed over this as if it was, you know, yeah, before you die, you say a confession. Okay. Well, no, this is a deeply moving religious practice for Jews. Longfuss writes in, in the, one of his, uh, in the particulars, he writes, end of summer 1943, this was a transport of Jews from Tarnov. They inquired where they were being taken. They were told they would be liquidated, meaning murdered. They were already standing naked. A heavy, serious mood overtook them. They became lost in thought and whispered the confession, the vidui for the sins of the past. All of their emotions had become dulled and only one thought stunned and electrified them, the need to take account of their souls before extinction. Wow. Um, what is this vidui? What is this confession? This is part of the Jewish experience. On Yom Kippur, in the traditional prayer book, we, throughout the, the whole service of Yom Kippur, from the beginning in the evening to the following day, 24 hours, following evening, 24 hour, 25 hours later, there is 11 recitations of the vidui, of the confession. And this is the, it's a formula. It's a formula I can recite some of by heart, even though I haven't recited it in a synagogue in decades. Ashamnu, bagadnu, gazalnu, dibalnu, dofi. This is, why do I beat my chest? Because this is what you do when you recite the confession. This is what it says in English. We are not so arrogant and stubborn as to declare before thee, that we are wholly righteous and without sin. Surely we have sinned. We have offended. We have betrayed. We have robbed. We have spoken basely. We have been devious. We have been mean. We have been arrogant. We have been violent. We have been false. And on and on and on. Every sin you can imagine. You may not have individually done that, but someone has done that. And we're asking God to forgive our sins. We have turned away from your goodly commandments this actually appears in the Gospel of Luke, a reference to the vidui, to the confession. Luke 18, 9 to 14, it says, Two men went up to the temple to pray. This is a parable of Yeshua. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Thieves, right? They're beating their chest saying thieves, rogues, adulterers, Right? That's what they're beating their chest saying. I don't, I might beat my chest, but I know that I'm not like them. I'm a good, I've never done any sins. I'm good. Or even like this tax collector. And the tax collector standing far off would not as so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast. 2,000 years are doing the same thing. When I first read this in the New Testament, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what I do every synagogue, every, every Yom Kippur in the synagogue. He beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So imagine, this is being done 2,000 years ago by Jews, this confession, this vidui, and it appears in Auschwitz, in the diaries of Leib Langfuss. The two Hungarian Jews asked the Zunderkommando, should we say the, the vidui, the confession? He replied in the affirmative. They, th they then pulled out bottles of brandy and drank happily, raising their bottles in a toast to l'chaim, to life, which I can't say I entirely understand. Um, but maybe they at least knew what was going to happen to them. They had been living in terror, thinking they were going to maybe die at any moment, wouldn't know if they were going to live or die. And they must have been Hasidim. I, I don't say that even jokingly. Like that's a very Hasidic thing to do, I think, in some respects. The Zunder commando became very emotional and burst out weeping. He ran into the crematorium and sobbed bitterly for a long time. We have burned enough Jews. Let us destroy everything in ourselves as well for the sanctification of the name, Kiddush Hashem. 
And that's a theme that we're going to see again, the sanctification of the name. There are these themes that are weaved throughout these uh, Auschwitz documents. Let's get to the Shema Yisrael. That's what we were looking for. Passover 1944. This is the actual source that I saw years ago at Yad Vashem. This is the actual account. Pesach 1944. A transport arrived from Vittel in France, including several Jewish notables. One of them was the rabbi of Bayonne, the late Rabbi Moshe Friedman. He had been one of the great Jewish scholars of Poland, a truly rare patriarchal figure. Who is this Moshe Friedman? This is him. He was a beloved rabbi in Poland. He was one of the leading rabbis of Poland. They called him Moshenu, our Moshe, our Moses. He was known as the Boyana Rebbe. He was a Hasidic Rebbe, Hasidic leading rabbi of, of a denomination called the Boyaner. Um, but everybody loved Rabbi Moshe in Poland. All branches of Jews, he was, he, was, he was really a unifying figure. And just so you understand, I mean, I didn't know who this was. But I looked into who this was. And just to give you a, a comparison, imagine if you... If there's, God forbid, may it never happen, but imagine if there was a Holocaust today and you're as under commando and all of a sudden a, a, gr a group arrives, let's say 10 years ago, and standing there naked before you, stripped about to be sent into the gas chamber, is Billy Graham. That's the stature of this rabbi in Poland at the time. And so this little rabbi, no, Rabbi uh, Le Blancfus from a little town in Poland, he sees this man and he, he can't even believe it. It's Moshe who's standing before us. Rabbi Moshe undressed along with everyone else. He then addressed the Oberscharfuhrer, that's the, the SS commander. Holding on to the lapel of his coat, he spoke to him in German. Do not think that you will succeed in destroying the Jewish people. The Jewish people will live forever. The innocent blood you have spilled will be demanded of you. He spoke, he spoke with great emotion and great strength. Then when he had finished, he put on his hat. I'm going to stop here for a second. The hat is the symbol of a rabbi, the big black hat. The man is standing there naked, and he puts on his hat. That's really significant. And in great excitement, called out, Shema Yisrael! And all the Jews faithfully responded with him, Shema Yisrael! Out of a sense of profound faith, which had surrounded them, in the last moments of their lives. It was a moment of supreme elevation, such as may be encountered but once in a lifetime, proving the eternal nature of Jewish spiritual experience. So when I started this research, I began with, a, with critical thinking. I was skeptical, and it was right for me to be skeptical. But I found out this was real. This really happened, and it was recorded by an eyewitness. It was recorded by an eyewitness witness who didn't survive, who wrote down what happened. And those who did survive went back to look for some of these documents. This one turned up in 1952. Um, what I didn't know when I was studying this, what I really wanted to do was find not just the translation. I found the English translation of the document. I found the Yiddish original printed in a book in Israel in 1972. I wanted to see the original handwritten document, the autograph. I mean, autograph in a manuscript means the one written by hand by the original author. And there was a book written in 2015 about the scrolls of Auschwitz. It's called something like Understanding the Scrolls of Auschwitz. And they referred to this as, as a lost scroll. They said it was missing. It had been brought, to, it was discovered in Poland and it was in, the, in a museum in Poland and nobody knew where it was. I found it. Um, and I actually contacted the authors. They said, yeah, we found it too after we wrote the book. So um, it's at Yad Vashem in Israel. And what apparently happened is the head of the Jewish Museum in Warsaw was experiencing persecution for being a Jew in 1968 in Poland, persecution at the hands of the communists, and so he went to Israel. And apparently he stuck this in his luggage and brought it with him. And this is it. This is the actual document, which is on the website of Yad Vashem, Israel's National Holocaust Museum. And this is the passage where it says in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael. And again, 
Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel. Now it's in Yiddish, and uh, I don't read Yiddish, but I can make out some of the words from what I learned from my grandmother, very little Yiddish. And what's really moving to me in a sense, in, in many ways, is, is these words here. It's the, translated in English, she said it with great excitement. But in the, in, the, in the Yiddish, it says, Gefaltaka hitlahavut, or hitlahavus in Yiddish. Hitlahavut is a Hebrew word. Yiddish has many Hebrew words. Gewaltika. You've ever heard Jews say, oy vey gewalt. Gewalt means with intensity. With a, so a gewaltika hitlahavus. Hitlahavut is from the word lahav, which is a flame of fire. And hitlahavut means a burning, a, a, how do I describe this? A, a burning excitement. That's the best way to describe it. A flaming excitement. He said, he didn't just say, Shema Yisrael. He said, Shema Yisrael. And the Jews responded, Shema Yisrael. As they were going to their deaths. So this sounded like it was the archetypal martyrdom story, but it turned out it was, really happened. And it was recorded, not decades later, by somebody trying to reshape history, but by somebody in the thick of the events who knew he was going to die and knew he had to leave a legacy of what happened to document the history of what happened, of what the Nazis did and, and how the Jews behaved in the last moments before they died, that they still had faith in that moment in the creator of the universe, that they went to their deaths like Rabbi Akiva, that they went to their deaths like the Jews in the German crusade of 1096, proclaiming the oneness of God, Shema Yisrael. Now, I found this document, and I was very, very happy because, I, you know, I, I went into this. I, I wanted it to be true. But if it wasn't, I was fine with that too. And I found that it was true. What I didn't know is there's a second account of Shema Yisrael in the scrolls of Auschwitz. Zalman Leventhal, in, uh, uh, in the eighth cache discovered in 1962, he wrote this in 1944, presumably, now here, a lot of it is missing because it was found so late and it was damaged by water. So that's what those dashes are. We don't know what the, in the blanks. We can't fill them in. He wrote the screams. Were, oh, and he's describing his first few nights in Auschwitz when he's separated from his family when they get off the train and he's thinking, you know, we'll be allowed to see them every Sunday. There's rumors going around. Maybe we'll see them once a month, our family. And then he's thrown into a bunk and told, no, your family's dead. And he's like, well, they're messing with us, right? They, I mean, our family's dead. We're, we came here to work. How would they kill people? They, my wife could do some work. Well, that can't be true. And then they find out what it is true. The screams were still heard. Slowly became weaker. The people were killed. The half who could not get into the bunker, remember, they, they sometimes were over capacity, and they cut the, train, the, the selection of people in half, Half went to the gas chamber, half waited. So these are the half that waited. The half who could not get into the bunker remained sitting naked in wooden barracks. A strong winter cold. Listen to the screams and cries of those who, and with a cry of Shema Yisrael on their lips, and how they became silent and were killed. The last words of faith on these people's lips as they died, not just this rabbi and his one group of people, this probably happened tens of thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times, that the Jews, as they were being gassed in the chambers and shot in other places, they would recite Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel. Now, we talked about Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of the name, and uh, that was something that particularly we hear from Leib Langfus. He talks about that quite a bit. And look, I've done a lot of research on the name of God, so it's something near to my heart and dear to me. And when I saw this, I was very moved that there was a, a self-awareness that when they were being killed and murdered by the Nazis, it was an act of sanctifying God's holy name. Now, Leib Longfuss was expel, uh, um, expelled in 1942, and we actually have a photo of the event, which is unbelievable. He wrote a document describing how he was expelled from his hometown where he was the rabbi. And we have a photo of that expulsion. He may be one of the men in this photo. We don't know. We don't have a photo that we, we, to identify Leib Langfus. This is before Facebook. Um, he wrote a document called The Deportation that was discovered in 1945. 
kept in an attic until 1970. And he describes when the Jews were gathered in his town of Makov, Makova, how they were uh, told by the Germans they were going to be taken for a work detail in the east. We're not going to kill you. We're just going to take you to work. You're, you know, Jews don't work. We're going to take you to work, put you to work for the war effort. And the people in the town are talking, well, what's happening? Well, what do we do? The most moving and bravest of the speakers was the last, the Dayan of Makov. Here he's referring to himself in third person, which is quite interesting. He dealt with the subject with complete frankness, warning against illusions and unwillingness to believe. People should be ready and prepared for the fact that they were taking us to an inevitable death. When leaving their houses, they should say farewell to all their nearest, to their wives, to their children. We were all going to lay down our lives for Kiddush Hashem, for the sanctification of the name of God. And this is incredible that this is a concept that appears first in Leviticus. It's something that's emphasized in Ezekiel, that through the way you behave, through your actions, you can sanctify God's name. You can also desecrate his name if you're a bad person. And what does that mean to sanctify his name? Everyone looks upon you and says, this is a decent man. Or you, you sin and live a life of sin and people look upon you and say, oh, those people who worship the God of Israel, that's how they act. That's a desecration of God's name. And people who were martyred, who were murdered for the very fact of being Jews, were described as dying for Kiddush Hashem, for the sanctification of the name. And this is, i got to emphasize this point. I didn't see this in the English literature. It's discussed, it's discussed extensively in the Hebrew literature. That this was actually a question the rabbis asked. They said, up until now, when we talked about sanctification of the name, what we meant is the Gentiles came to us and said, convert to Islam or we'll kill you. Convert to Catholicism or we'll kill you. And if the Jew said no and he was killed, that was a sanctification of the name. In the Holocaust, they didn't give them a choice. They just killed them for being Jews. And not only didn't they give them the choice, they rounded up thousands of Christians whose grandparents had been Jews. There were Jews who converted to Christianity and married other Christians, and they had children, and they had children. To the Nazis, those were all Jews who needed to be killed. And the rabbi said, look, they're not only killing us for our faith, they're killing the people who, from our perspective, left our faith. Is that a Kiddush Hashem? When a Jew who converted to Christianity is killed for being a Jew, and they decided it is. Because the man is being killed, or the woman is being killed for the very fact that he's a Jew. Not out of his choice, but simply that he's a Jew, he's being killed, and that is a sanctification of God's holy name. Um, in the particulars, Leigh Blankfuss writes, among the transports arriving from Bejin and Sosnovich was an old rabbi. As residents of the immediate vicinity, the deportees knew they were being taken to their death. The rabbi entered the dressing room in the bunker, singing and dancing. He was privileged to die for Kiddush Hashem. I mean, I, this, I, don't know what, I don't have words for this. If you told me this story and didn't tell me the source, I'd say, yeah, I don't believe it. I wouldn't believe something like that. It's too much of a martyr story. It's the story of Rabbi Akiva. He's reciting the Shema while he's being skinned alive? How can that be? What? Nobody does that. He's screaming for his life. He's not thinking about God. And these Jews went to their death, joyous, some of them, for Kiddush Hashem, to sanctify God's holy name. I found an amazing document. It was written in 1963. And it's about a rabbi who is telling the story of what happened on October 29, 1941. He was in the Kovno Ghetto. Kovno was the second major Jewish city in Lithuania. Today it's called Kaunas. And in, um, on October 29th, there was an event that the Jews called the Great Action at something called the Ninth Fort. 2,007 men were murdered, shot to death. 2,920 women, 4,273 children. Now the Jews are waiting for the selection. There's 30,000 Jews. They don't know who's going to be selected to, for death. It turns out about a third of the Jews were selected for death. They figured, well, you can't work. We're going to kill you. Or we don't like the look of your face. We're going to kill you. Whatever. For whatever reason, they selected those people. There was an old rabbi there who came over to Rabbi Ephraim Oshri. And he said, look, I, I know I'm not going to make it through the day. 
I can't work. I'm a sick old man. I know I'm going to die, and I'm dying for Kiddush Hashem. Now, in rabbinical Judaism, every act of serving God is sanctified through a blessing. When you eat an apple, you say the blessing, Baruch atah Adonai, Bore pri ha'etz. When you eat a potato, you say, Bore pri ha'adama. When you drink a cup of water, you say a different blessing. Every s- sacred act can be sanctified to God. And this rabbi comes to Rabbi Ephraim Oshri, this old rabbi from Poland. He says, I know, I know I'm going to die today. What's the blessing over the sanctification of the name? That's his thought hours before death. And the man died that day. And Rabbi Oshri wrote in 1963, he tells the story. He, and he gives the answer that he gave to that rabbi. Knowing the rabbi knew he was going to die, right? We don't know if that man's going to live or not, but I'm an old man. I'm sick. No way they don't pick me. And they picked him. He died. He tells the story here on page 29 of his book, Mima'am Akim. And this is the prayer. Blessed art thou, Lord, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments, commanding us to love the awesome and honorable name of the one who is and the one who was and the one who in the future will be. With all our heart and all our soul, to sanctify his name in public. Blessed art thou, Lord, who sanctifies your name in public. Afterwards, he will say, Shema Yisrael, and then deliver his neck for sanctification of the name. This is the ruling that Rabbi Oshri related based on an earlier uh, ruling of a rabbi in the 16th century, which we'll see in a minute. Um, so there was an actual blessing. So we read about the sanctification of the name. This isn't some abstract concept. Le Blancfus was a rabbi, a dayan. He knew what he was talking about. I don't know if he said these exact words, but they said something like this. They were proclaiming the sanctification of God's name and the meaning of God's name. Because what is that statement, the one who was, the was, who is, and one who in the future will be? That's actually the meaning of God's name. Every Jew knows this from Adon Olam. It's a prayer recited by virtually every Jewish community in the world. This is from the Sephardic community of Constantinople, 1863. But open any prayer book and they have this prayer. It's Adon Olam Asher Malach. That's the tune I learned growing up. Uh, Many people know the Israeli tune from Uzi Chitman, 1976. That's much more popular today, but I'll sing the one I learned. Beterem kol yitzir nivra. Which means, and he is he who was, and he is he who is, and he is. He who will be. The exact words that we see in the prayer of the sanctification of the name. In the 12th century, there's a rabbi named Yosef Bechor Shor, and he writes in his commentary in Exodus 3.14. This is the meaning of the name. Hove, he is. Hayah, he was. And Yehiyah, he will be. Now, what are they saying here? And, and I have a much longer teaching on this called the, the Great I Am Revealed. I'll just give you the... the Short version. The three Hebrew forms of the verb to be, haya, hove, and yehiyah, he who was, he who is, and he who will be, when you take them together and combine them into a single word, you get the name of the God of Israel that appears in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, 6,827 times, the name Yehovah. You not only get that name, you get it with its pronunciation. And when they recited that prayer before they went to their deaths, they knew what God's name was. They knew it was yud heh vav And whether they knew the pronunciation or not, they knew the meaning of the name was he who was, he who is, and he who will be. Hayah This actually appears in the book of Revelation. And I bring this only to show that this continues as a thought in Jewish culture, 
going back to the first century AD, and in my teaching, The Great I Am Revealed, I bring other Jewish sources outside the New Testament. I bring the Targum, for example, that shows this is in Jewish culture. But it goes back 2,000 years, all the way from the first century in the book of Revelation and the Targum and other sources, through to the 20th century in Auschwitz. I mean, that's incredible. I was talking to this, this scholar, and he said, well, that's just the folk explanation of the name. I said, if so, it's a very persistent one. Um, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full, of, and are full of eyes all around and inside, day and night, without ceasing, they sing, holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come, which is Haya Hove Yeh. And it appears five times with some variations in the book of Revelation. And like I said, it appears in other Jewish sources. And then we find it as the prayer over the sanctification of the name or part of that prayer in the Holocaust. And why is that prayer being recited? Because it's the meaning of the name. And while you're sanctifying the name, it is appropriate to proclaim the meaning of that name and in a coded way to proclaim what that name is. There was a rabbi in 1723 who wrote a book. His name was Rabbi Yosef Han. And he's quoting from an earlier rabbi named Yossel of Rosheim in the 16th century. And this is actually the source of Rabbi Oshri's prayer, of his blessing over the sanctification of the name. This was a period in Germany when there were, there were martyrdoms. It wasn't an unusual event. When a persecution takes place, let him say the confession. And what's interesting about this is this is the expanded version. Rabbi Oshri gives us the, the short version. Rabbi Yosef Han explains the scrolls of Auschwitz and what the Dayan of Makov, uh, Le Blancfus, is talking about. He has all these references to this, but people miss it because they don't know the Jewish context of, what, of the scrolls of Auschwitz. Like, you'd think you would know that, right? You'd think it would be important. When a persecution takes place, let him say the Vidui, the confession. And then he, re then he gives you a, a short version of the confession. You know what it is because you say it 11 times in Yom Kippur. He doesn't need to waste ink on it. My God and God of my fathers... Ashamti, Bagadati. I have sinned, I have offended, I have betrayed. Behold, the time has come for my life to be taken from me and to deliver it into, the hand, into your hand for Kiddush Hashem, for the sanctification of your unique name. And that's quite interesting. It says your unique name. The unique name is one of the titles of the Tetragrammaton. In English, we say Tetragrammaton to refer to the name yud Hey vav Hey, the four-letter holy name of God. In Jewish literature, they call the Shema Mufurash, the explicit or unequivocal name, or often they call it Shema Miuchad, the unique name. And why the unique name? Well, the thought of the rabbis was any angel or deity can be called God. Moses is called a God. You know, the gods of the pagans were called gods. Anybody can be called Lord. There's only one who can be called Jehovah. And therefore, that's his unique name. The prayer goes on, at his, or the instruction goes on of Rabbi Yosef Han, quoting Rabbi Yosef of Rosheim. At his end, let him say in accordance with the joy of Rabbi Akiva to fulfill the verse, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. That's the second verse of the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.5. Blessed art thou, Lord, King of the universe, who sanctifies, this is the actual blessing. Blessed art thou, Lord, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments, commanding us to love the awesome and honorable name of the one who is, and the one who was, and the one who in the future will be, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. With these words in his mouth, let the persecuted person deliver his life for Kiddush Hashem, for the sanctification of his blessed name. And what you see here in, in Yosef Han's uh, passage quoting from Yosel of Rosheim, which then in the Holocaust is actually implemented, are five elements that we actually see in the scrolls of Auschwitz. And I, I feel like they unlock the scrolls of Auschwitz in a way that, that I haven't seen other scholars do because they're not looking at it from this perspective of the faith who, of the people who actually went through this. There's the vidui, the confession. Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of the name. There's the meaning of the name. Haya, Hovei, Hiyeh. The one who was, the one who is, the one who will be. There's Deuteronomy 6.5. And you shall love the Lord your God, which is not just some you know, vague statement. What they're thinking about when they say that is, 
the part with all your soul, which means your life. Put your money where your mouth is or your soul where your faith is. And then as they're dying, Shema Yisrael. Everyone please stand. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here today to learn about the history of your people who suffered persecution. And Father, when they suffered persecution, they didn't go to their deaths boldly. They went to their deaths acknowledging their sin. Father, they went to their death for the sanctification of your name. Father, they went to your, set, when they went to your death proclaiming Hayahoveh, he had the meaning of your name. They went to their deaths proclaiming the love for you expressed through giving up their lives. And finally, the last words in their breath before they died were Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. You have been listening to Nehemia Gordon's Raw's Dream of Torah Consciousness. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's McCore Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.